It was tossed to the side. But in the end, we pulled the trigger. We pulled the trigger. So did that. This is something that's just bad. It's hard for me to understand that, but. And if he hadn't put the thing about decodes in there, I probably would even look at it closer. But the map is in there, it's like. Good, good evening. We'd like to welcome all of you here to the Durham City Council meeting at 7.01 p.m. on Monday, February 3rd. Uh, if we take a moment of silent meditation, please. Thank you. I would ask the clerk if she would, I would do prison, leaving Councilman Dean Brown, if you leave some pledge. Okay, well, we got. We are blessed to have with us tonight to lead us in the pledge, Miss Destiny Quick. And her mom, Dewana Langley, is out in the audience. I met her during kids voting and she was responsible for my getting 100% of the kids vote. So I thought I better bring it. I'm Destiny Quick. I will be leading. I will be leading you in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Thank you, Destiny. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Katati. Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. And Councilmember Shule.
Uh, let me again say good evening, and it is really my distinct pleasure to welcome you to my 12th annual State of the City Address. Uh, to my fel fellow city council members, uh, fellow elected officials, I see Commissioner Reckow present, uh, city staff, business, and community leaders, all of you who are present here tonight, I uh, certainly want to thank you for being here. Uh, each year I, I'm honored to have your presence when I give the State of the City Address, and i also like to welcome my fellow residents who are viewing us on DTV8, as well as those who are watching tonight's live stream from the City of Durham's website. At this time of the year, my job as mayor is to provide an honest assessment of the past year and look ahead to the coming year. As we exit a long period of economic uncertainty and challenges, our great city accomplished a lot on many different fronts, from downtown and neighborhood development to maintaining our strong financial standing. And there's no doubt that while we accomplished a lot, a lot remains to be done. Continuing to fight crime and its underlying social causes remains high on the city's agenda. Hand in hand with that goal is something that Durham, as perhaps one of the most diverse cities in this state, has to intentionally strengthen, which is relationship building, thereby strengthening trust between government and different communities within our city. But before I go on, I'd like us to get started by continuing our tradition of looking back at the year before. But looking at our accomplishments, our accolades, at how well we all work together to achieve our mission to make Durham a great place to live, work, and play. In fact, some may have thought that with shrinking resources and efforts to do more with less, our goal might seem to have been a mission impossible. But as you view this short video, you'll see that in 2013, we took charge to make our great city and the next level trying to move it to the next level. And by doing that, you see that what we did, we were able to make really a mission possible. I, I would really want to uh, Your mission, should you choose to you accept it, closely. is to make Durham a great place to live, work, and play.
You see that rhythm I said the manager had? Boom, boom, boom. All right. I, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank the Office of Public Affairs for giving us a look back at many of the highlights of this year. So much of what we accomplished was the result of a successful partnership and relationship between the City Council and the City staff, led by City Manager Tom Bonfield and our remarkable community. And I'm going to tell my colleagues on the Council I'd ask the staff to make copies of that video so when you guys wonder, is it all worth it? You can slide it into your computer, look at it, and say, yeah, it's all worth it. it you, you get it when it's all over. Two years ago, the City Council, working with City staff, established five strategic goals to guide us as we serve the residents of Durham. They are a strong and diverse economy, safe and secure community, thriving, livable neighborhoods, a well-managed city, and stewardship of city's physical assets. And while all of these goals are important to ensure that Durham is a city that we're all proud of, one of the issues that has a very high priority for me is embodied in the strategic goal, safe and secure community. This involves working to continue the reduction of crime, particularly violent crime. And as you know, violent crime consists of aggravated assaults, rape, robbery, and homicides. We as a community and law enforcement have made progress in reducing crime in our city. And while violent crime, which is something we focus on particularly this past year, is down by 5.6% compared to 2012, Property crime, which includes burglary, larceny, and theft, is up nearly 6%. Both categories combined to drive our overall crime up by 4.3% since 2012. And I continue to call on the community to work together with the police department to not only reduce crimes in the coming year, but also to help solve them. I'm of the opinion that for us to be a truly great city, we have to do more to reduce crime and enhance our feelings of safety in our communities. Another issue that is a very high priority for me is reflected in the strategic goal, thriving, livable neighborhoods. Increasing the amount of affordable housing and contingent neighborhood re revitalization efforts, particularly those in neighborhoods that have been depressed for long periods of time, is a very important issue for Durham. I continue to believe that strong neighborhoods make a strong city and contribute greatly to the quality of life in Durham. In a way, those two strategic goals, a safe and secure community, thriving and livable neighborhoods, are interconnected. The one issue that connects the two strategic goals, but also differentiates between them, is the level of poverty, uh, absence of poverty within a neighborhood. The presence of poverty is not a justification for crime, but its presence and the accompanying deficits in education, job training, jobs, poor health care, and lack of access to services are all contributing factors to the level of crime. Poverty and its contributing attributes also help determine whether or not we have a safe and secure community and thriving, livable neighborhoods. Our city is great, as you've seen from our earlier video. Great things are indeed happening in Durham. The state of our city is good, but it can be better. But working together, focusing and addressing some of our key challenges, we can make it a much better city for those who live here, for those who visit, and for those newcomers who may choose to make Durham their home. A key challenge that we must undertake to make our city even greater is work to reduce poverty in Durham. Today I am proposing that we as a city council, city administration, and residents of Durham accept that challenge and make it a key priority to reduce poverty in our city, neighborhood by neighborhood, year by year, starting in 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now you might ask, why focus on poverty now? Uh, you may be aware that 50 years ago, President Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty. And in North Carolina, Governor Terry Sanford created the North Carolina Fund to create economic opportunity for people living in poverty. And although some progress has been made, been made by many accounts nationally and locally, it's a war on which we've lost focus, with more people living in poverty than just 10 years ago. Secondly, here in Durham, we have focused a lot on our effort on our downtown revitalization over the past 12 years, with many great results. 
public-private partnerships have resulted in an increased overall investment in downtown with construction and revitalization well underway. And the success of DPAC is an example that can't go unmentioned. And two years ago, we dedicated a penny for affordable housing, enabling the transformation of the once depressed South Side and Rolling Hills area into housing for people of various income levels and serving as a source of revenue for future efforts to provide affordable housing. We're making progress on areas in which we have intentionally focus our combined efforts. We as a city have made significant progress, creating a can-do attitude on the whole of our city. Now is the time to take those same steps that we have used to move our great city forward to address those among us who have the least. Uh, let me share with you some national facts, which some of you may even be surprised. According to the Center for Law and Social Poverty, known by the acronym of CLASS, and the new census data, almost one in five U.S. children are poor, which is almost 22%. In 2012, over 16 million children in the United States were living in poverty. And according to the official measure, poverty is defined as living in families with income under $19,090 for a family of three. Children are more likely than adults to be poor. Children under age three have the highest poverty rates with potentially lasting consequences for education, health, and other key outcomes. Racial and ethnic minority children are disproportionately poor. Child poverty is linked to negative child and adult outcomes, and many children in poverty have working parents. Those were national statistics and facts. But did you know that poverty affects approximately 20% of people who live in Durham. That's nearly one in every five people, persons who are either homeless, cannot afford adequate housing, or are paying more than 30% of their income on housing, making them choose between food for their children, transportation to get to their jobs, and paying for other basic necessities like medicine. These are choices no one should have to make in our society, especially in Durham. L let's take a closer look. According to a 2013 study by the UNC Poverty Center, many of our poor neighbors live in areas that are just blocks from the most prosperous areas of our, of our city. In certain parts of East Durham, which has been an area of focus for both the city and county, the poverty rate is even higher. I just travel down Dillard and Pettigrew Street, which is identified by the census tract 11. The poverty rate, poverty rate there is 37.5%. Travel east to Census Tract 10.01 to the neighborhoods around Holton Career and Resource Center near East Durham Park. The overall poverty rate is 44.1%, with an overwhelming 63% of children living in poverty. And it gets even worse as you travel south to Census Tract 14.00, the areas around Grant Park and Durham Technical Community College, where over half of the res residents live in poverty including eight and 10 children. Now, now don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that poverty is exclusive to Durham. If we look at the ranking of leading cities in North Carolina, according to the US.com, Durham, North Carolina, the historical poverty level data, and ACS 2010 data, Durham, which had a population then of almost 230, 29,000 people, 46, 1,167, which is about 21%, live in poverty. It's composed of 17.9, almost 17.5% in North Carolina, and about 15.3% in the U.S. If we look at Durham families that are in poverty, it's about 7,800, which represent about 14.67%, as compared to 13.3% of North Carolina families living in poverty, and 11.26% of U.S. families living in poverty. Durham's poverty rate ranked at 21.03%, which is sixth in the state. And if you look at the chart, you can, might not see it very clearly, but we have cities ranging, ranging from the largest city, Charlotte, up into Greensboro, Fayetteville, Raleigh, Winston-Salem, Greensboro, Durham, High Point, Asheville, Gastonia, Wilmington. And Durham sort of sits right in the middle at about 21% of poverty. 
What I'm saying is that it is time that we as a community come together to do something about this affliction that directly or indirectly affects us all. As I described in the beginning of my remarks, whether it is manifested through crime, through health disparities, through high school dropouts and unemployment, it's time to stop hoping that the solution to solving or reducing poverty will occur by some wealth which will trickle down or that rising tides will raise all boats. It's just not happening. In fact, the UNC Poverty Center showed that just the opposite is happening. People living in many of the neighborhoods pointed out tonight are experiencing higher poverty rates, especially children, than they were just 10 years ago. We as a city and county are rich in many resources. We live in a great place in this state, in this country. We have great universities. We are home to the Research Triangle Park, many talented persons, a city classified as a creative city, with many entrepreneurs, innovators, and more. We must find a way to harness those many resources to focus or target the reduction in poverty in our community. Now, fortunately, some leaders in our faith community took the lead last year to take some very specific action steps to reduce poverty in our community. And one major priority that they've taken is to develop what they call intentional relationships across the lines of privileges and poverty at all income levels. A plan for reducing poverty neighborhood by neighborhood, year by year, must incorporate specific actions. I'd like to ask uh, the Reverend Mel Williams and Cameron Smith if they would mind standing. Thank you. Now, some of you may remember Mel as the former pastor of Watch Street Baptist Church, but Mel is also the coordinator of In Poverty Durham. And this organization is helping to lead the way by putting a laser-like focus on how we as a community can work together to reduce poverty. What is key among their approaches is to develop intentional relationships across lines of privilege and poverty. And working with Mel is Cameron Smith, who coordinates a project called Relationships, Equipping Allies and Leaders, or the acronym Real Durham. And here's how it works. Starting in March, Real Durham will match individuals or families in poverty with four volunteers who offer not only friendship and understanding, but other important resources, such as access to financial planning, job training, and interview skills, finding safe and affordable housing and healthcare options, the essential needs to step out of po poverty. This program is modeled on the National Circles Campaign, which has seen measurable success in the lives of people they've touched since 2008. I and many others believe this program has real promise. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Cameron. Another organization that is focusing on steering our young people in the right direction for gainful employment is a program by Manpower Development Corporation, MDC, and it's called Made in Durham. This program is chaired by Dr. Victor Zhao, Chancellor of Health Affairs at Duke University and President and CEO of the Duke University Health System, and consists of Durham's top public business and community leaders, such as NCCU Chancellor Deborah Saunders White and our own city manager, Tom ban Bonfield, along with others. But before I speak more about Made in Durham, just let me share a few national facts that were provided by the Center for Law and Social Policy. One, the high unemployment situation of black males has been persistent and historically unacceptable. It has endured for decades. Work opportunities for black male teens have all but disappeared. The Great Recession dealt a knockout blow to young black men. Black males as well as Hispanic males are overrepresented in low-wage jobs and underrepresented in professional and management jobs. Despite subsistent education gains since 1970 and high school completion and college enrollment for young blacks, black young blacks males, they still lag substantially behind their white counterparts in educational attainment. The criminal justice system is de delivering a crippling blow to employment prospects for young black men. Consider this. 
Black men, 18 and 19 years of age, were in prison at more than nine times the rate of white men. Black men, 20 to 24 years of age, were in prison at more than seven times the rate of white men. When surveyed, 60% of employees, employers indicated they would not hire an ex-offender. Studies show that increase of availability and accessibility of criminal black background data is associated with worse labor market outcomes for ex-offenders. Now, while all these facts that were given by CLAPS may not be the same for Durham, I suspect that to a certain extent, it mirrors Durham. And while the study focused on the plight of black and Hispanic males, Made in Durham is a program that is gender and ethnic neutral. But because Durham mirrors many of the statistics cited by, cited by CLAPS, that is why it is important and more important that the program Made in Durham be a success. It is known that only about half of Durham's youth will complete high school, go to college, and get a job by the time they are aged 25 years old. Moreover, many will struggle in the process, and some will not make it at all. There are now between 4,500 and 6,000 disconnected youth, enough to fill four Durham high schools, who are either at significant risk of dropping out of high school, or who are not pursuing any education, training, or employment. All of them have talent and aspiration for a better life. Together, they represent a source of workforce skills, civic participation, and tech taxpayer revenue that Durham can ill afford to waste. Made in Durham seeks to mobilize Durham's top public business and community leaders to help lead an education to career system through the creation of a formal partnership. The Made in Durham program is important if our young people are not able to acquire the necessary training for the jobs in our community, they may very well become a part of the jobless or unemployed, which may result in a life of poverty, acquiring all of the attributes that come with living in poverty. Located in one of the distressed census tracts that I mentioned earlier, the East Durham's Children Initiative is an example of public-private partnership working to prepare children to succeed in school and life. And under the leadership of David Reese and Barker French, and I like David and Barker to stand if you don't mind, if you don't mind. Barker's chairman, and I see Ellen Rakow is here, She's a member of East Durham Children's Initiative. And I know we had someone else here that was also. Where is it? Okay. I'm, I'm wanna, I want to get to Ms. Bass later. <laughs> I want to get to Ms. Bass later, okay. Ted Fitz, they're all up in my office. Mary, I, in fact, all of the persons that are associated with East Durham <laughs> Children's Initiative, if you would mind standing. I, I'm serious, this is important. <laughs> now, the reason I mentioned EDCI is because of what I said earlier in terms of trying to reach out. Uh, tonight, they have Miss Bass, and Miss Bass, I'd like you to stand. Uh, I met Ms. Bass uh, earlier this evening in my office, but Ms. Bass is raising her grandson who attends Y.E. Smith Elementary School. And although they are a family of low wealth, she's taken the necessary steps to help her grandson see that there's another path out of poverty. <laughs> Ms. Bass is engaged in his school, in the community, and with EDCI. And I'd like to thank all of them, as well as all the members of the EDCI board and any staff for being with us tonight, and more importantly, for the work that you do and will continue to do. Thank you. As mayor, I want to use the office of the mayor to raise the visibility of poverty in Durham. For some people, poverty is hidden in plain sight. Others see poverty and do not acknowledge that it exists or that it affects them. Some feel poverty and live in poverty every day, and some are just not aware of the extent of poverty in Durham. If, in fact, we're going to work to reduce poverty, it is important that we develop specific benchmarks for the reduction of poverty within the targeted neighborhoods. The state, through its Healthy North Carolina 2020 project, has set a goal of reducing the poverty rate in the state to 12.5% by the year 2020. And the county's public health department 
and partnership for a healthy Durham are working together to help reach that goal in Durham. Durham County's Public Health Director, Dale Garris, is, Gail, Gail Harris is here, and I know Gail very well. Please stand. Please stand, Gail, because I'd like people to see you. Probably everybody knows you. Again, I, I want to thank Gail for all the work she does to help improve the lives of Durham residents. And just as the city and county have been working together on specific areas of their respective strategic goals, I want to encourage the city, the county, and partner organizations to work together to achieve this goal of reducing poverty. As a city, we must work in partnership with existing efforts by those nonprofit, private sector, and county government. Those sectors work well together when we're revitalizing downtown, and we should be able to work just as well to reduce poverty in our community. We must utilize and better prioritize existing financial resources. Now, this is not a call at this time for more financial resources, but a call for better coordination and collaboration of existing resources, strengthening partnership efforts, building what has already been started by our faith community. In closing, I, I'm reminded of the recent Sunday ceremony on January 19, 2004, that was delivered by Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove during Watch Street Baptist Church, Baptist Church Martin Luther King service. Jonathan spoke about the actions of Reverend King and his civil rights efforts. It was called for a collective action during the Montgomery bus boycott. The mayor, the city, city council, the city administration, we don't have any monopoly on solutions to reducing poverty in Durham. It will take collective action by all in Durham who have a concern about the level of poverty in Durham. And tonight, I'm calling on all of us to begin to take that collective action toward reducing poverty in Durham neighborhoods year by year starting now. This road to reducing poverty will not be an easy road. It will be a road of endurance and time. The achievements will not be readily seen or felt by many. It will not be analogous to the revitalization of a neighborhood, a revitalization of downtown Durham, where we can see the, where we can see the physical transformations take place with the ongoing construction that eventually gets completed and results in a finished product. Our focus is on people, people who live in poverty, and for many, though no fault of their own, who have been in poverty for many years. The road out of poverty for many does not happen overnight, and many roadblocks have to be overcome. It is not a road to be traveled alone. People in poverty will have to be willing to travel that road in partnership, acting collectively with those who are willing to assist in that journey. But I remain convinced that if we as a community have the will and determination, and if it can be done anywhere, reducing poverty can be accomplished in Durham, where great things happen, great things do happen, and this will be one of the things to add to our list. In the coming months, I will be calling together community leaders, people in poverty, and organizations to help devel develop an overall plan and roadmap with the benchmarks to meet that challenge. Again, I want to thank you for your time and patience, and I want to again say, Durham, let us move forward together to achieve the goal of reducing poverty in Durham, neighborhood by neighborhood, year by year, starting in 2014. Thank you, and God bless Durham, and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, we're going to take a short break to begin our regular council meeting at 7.40 p.m. And I see that Senator Mike Wood, former city council person, is with us. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.
Thank you. We'd like to reconvene the Durham City Council meeting at 7.44 p.m. We have a couple of ceremonial items, and I would ask Councilman Moffitt if he's available to... Good evening. I'm the liaison with the Human Relations Commission and the mayor has privileged me with presenting us tonight. Whereas the Durham Human Relations Commission has diligently served the city of Durham since 1968 and continues to promote a spirit of goodwill and mutual respect among individuals, groups, races, persons of differing social and economic status, as well as religious beliefs. I'm gonna take a moment and say, I'm gonna back up I'm going to tell you, this is the first time I've done this, so I'm going to start over. <laughs> first thing I want to do is introduce three people that um, are involved with the Human Relations Commission and the division. First of all is our chair, Ricky Hart. You can come over here, please. Vice Chair, um, Phil Seib. And uh, the uh, director of the division, Delilah Donaldson. Thank you. Okay, I'll try it again. Whereas the Human Relations Commission has diligently served the city of Durham since 1968 and continues to promote a spirit of goodwill and mutual respect among individuals, groups, races, and persons of differing social and economic status, as well as religious beliefs, and whereas the Durham Human Relations Division enforces the city's fair housing ordinance and remains committed to eliminating discrimination, housing disparities, hate crimes and biases while promoting diversity and inclusion. And whereas the city of Durham believes that in order to achieve justice and equal opportunity for all, we must value and accept people and not just tolerate each other. And whereas the city of Durham has made tremendous progress in human relations in the years since the establishment of the Human Relations Commission, and looks forward to continued progress in addressing the serious human and civil rights challenges that still face us. And whereas the city of Durham owes its appreciation to all citizens who have contributed and continue to contribute to the advancement of the mutual understanding, fairness, justice, and equal opportunity for all. Now therefore, William V. Bill Bell, the mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, does hereby proclaim February 2014 is Human Relations Month in Durham, and hereby urges all citizens to take special note of this observance. And witness his hand and the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this third day of February 2014 by William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the Great City of Durham. <laughs> now, and each, uh, each of our, uh, Ricky will start. Commissioner uh, Chair Hart will begin. Good evening. Um, I would like to say thank you to the mayor, uh, giving honor and praise where it's due, and thanking the mayor, Mayor Bell, the city council, the Human Relations Commission liaison, Commissioner Don Moffitt, to the deputy city manager, Mr. Keith Caldwell, the NIS department director, Ms. Constance Stancil, Human Relations Manager, Mr. Lila Donaldson, Assistant Administrator, Ms. Juanita English, the Vice Chair of the Human Relations Commission, Mr. Phil Saib, and to all the Human Relations Commissioners, I would like to say thank you for the support of everyone, of the task that's been given to us. Uh, we are doing our best, our due diligence, to do what is tasked to us. And I'd just like to say thank you all for your support, um, and we look forward into assisting and doing whatever we can for the city of Durham. At this particular time, I will ask the HRC manager, Mr. Lila, to come forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair Hart. I am pleased and honored uh, to stand before you and proclaim February as Human Relations Month. Uh, not only is it significant uh, in Durham, it's significant pretty much nationwide. Uh, during the month of February. I thought also that in looking at the agenda and seeing that tonight, we're also going to com commemorate uh, Mr. Becton, and he was the person that hired me. In fact, 
uh, worked with him a few years before he retired, and and I thought that was uh, that that is something that it really takes you back a long ways, and um, and to have to uh, think about all the accomplishments that he did and what he did for human relations and bringing it forward. In fact, not only uh, having that ordinance created, but uh, being a director for the years. 20 plus years or whatever, however many years before you left. So I'm very pleased and honored to stand before you and to, to let you know that um, this is a very special day. And thank you. While we had uh, the community leaders and the concerned citizens here, uh, we wanted to take an opportunity to invite everybody to come out to the Human Relations Award Ceremony. It's the 12th annual Human Relations Award Ceremony being held February 21st at the Haytai Heritage Center at 6 p.m. It's free and open to the public. Uh, we're just asking for you to RSVP through the Neighborhood Improvement Services Office. Uh, it's, a, it's about a two-hour event where we get to uh, uh, honor four Durham citizens uh, for various awards and, and their, their, their work with the, the Durham community. Uh, we'll also have a keynote speaker, Mandy Carter, who is a who is based in Durham but internationally known as a civil rights and LGBT uh, uh, activist. Uh, there will be a couple uh, pieces uh, of spoken word done by uh, the Bull City Slam team. And uh, it's a great time. So if you all can come out, uh, just make sure you RSVP so we know the numbers. And that, that's, that's about it, I think. And with that, I'll present the proclamation to the chair. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Moffitt. Uh, the Mayor Pro Tem. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I'm honored to present the resolution memorializing Joseph William Anderson Becton, Jr. to the Becton family. Would you please come up, all of you? Uh, the, the first lady coming up is Joe's wife, uh, Edna Ray Becton, and some other family members. And uh, the resolution <coughs> reads, whereas Joseph William Anderson Beck Becton, Jr., a native of Durham, was born July 9, 1932, educated in the Durham public school system, graduated from Hillside High School in 1950, after which he served in the U.S. Marine Corps for four years, and whereas after leaving the military, he received a B.A. degree from North Carolina Central University in 1958, studied at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in municipal administration in 1972, and continued his studies in education on federal regulations related to civil rights law. And whereas, for more than 41 years, Joe was married to Edna Ray Becton, sharing many years of happiness with his high school sweetheart, I added that right. Uh, <laughs> classmate <laughs> and the love of his life. <laughs> and whereas Mr. Becton worked as an investigator with the New York City Social Services Department, and in 1970, he served as the executive director of the Human Relations Commission for the city of Durham until his retirement in 1993 after obtaining legislation to grant citizens of Durham the right to go into state courts to gain a resolution to charges of discrimination when all other alternatives had failed. And whereas, during his tenure as executive director of human relations, he was instrumental in seeking equal opportunities within the areas of education, 
employment, housing, and public accommodations after the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, 1968, and 1972, and whereas he touched the lives of many people through his professional and community affiliations to include the National Association of Human Rights Workers, North Carolina Chapter of NAHRW President 1973 through 1993, uh, International Organization of Human Rights, American Arbitration Association, the WTVD Advisory Committee, which he chaired from 1971 through 1977, WTVD Chairman Emeritus, uh, awarded 1978. Uh, the class of 1950 Hillside High School president, a charter member of James E. Shepard Sartoma Club, Sartoma State Director for two years from 91, 1991 to 1993, uh, Sartoma International Director from 1993 to 1995, and the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People John Avery Boys and Girls Club Board of Directors and the Bull Durham Youth League, just to name a few. And whereas Joe Becton <laughs> will be remembered for forging one of the most remarkable alliances this city has ever seen. His work with civil rights advocates Ann Atwater and the late C.P. Ellis, a former Durham Klan member, which is discussed in Osha Gray Davidson's book, The Best of Enemies, Race and Redemption in the New South. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Durham City Council, number one, that this city pauses in a moment of silence in memory of Joseph William Anderson Becton, Jr. that this city council pays homage for his service to mankind, leadership, and legacy as a longtime activist for civil rights, justice, and equality. Three, that this resolution be spread upon the official minutes of this governing body, and that a certified copy of this resolution be presented to his wife, Edna Ray. Becton. You know, we love Mr. B. Yes. <laughs> and he you. loved us too. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 And they don't know the names of the people who worked hard and struggled and were criticized and ridiculed for trying to gain equal access to employment opportunities, contracting opportunities. And Joe Becton was one of the strongest leaders. I worked in close proximity with him, so I know how strong he was. <laughs> Sometimes real, real strong. <laughs> he was outstanding, and uh, I, if, if it is possible that he's looking down upon us tonight, he, um, he really meant a lot to so, so many people and helped so many people, and I remember when he hired you. Yes, you can wipe your tears. I know. <laughs> thank you, Ray, for coming. And thank you so very, very much. You are quite very welcome. Very You're very quite welcome. welcome. Thanks for sharing Joe with us. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Let me ask, are there any comments by members of the council? Uh, then I would ask for prior items, first by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, members of the council. Uh, priority items this evening is agenda item number five the Main Street Bridge Replacement Water Line Utility Agreement with North Carolina Department of Transportation. We're requesting that this item be referred back to the administration. That's my only priority item. Uh, you've heard the manager's priority items. Entertain a motion. Second. Second. We're proper to move a second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? 
close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Ask the city attorney for any prior items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Likewise, city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda as printed. Consent agenda items may be approved with a single vote. I'll just read the heading of each item. Council member removes one, or the public removes one. We'll discuss that later in the program. Uh, item one is street and infrastructure appearances. Item two is amendment to the substance abuse and mental health services agreement grant project ordinance 14534. Item three is appointment and removal of deputy finance officer. Item four is recommendation by modification to personnel ordinance 42-7 annual leave and 42-8 sick leave city code. Item five has been referred back. Item six is Duke Energy Power Pole Replacement and your driver streetscape. Item eight is light transit vehicle conversion. Item nine is Durham Chapel Hill Carborough Metropolitan Planning Organization Memorandum of Understanding. And items 11 through 16, items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings, entertain a motion for approval. Move the agenda. Second. Uh, it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. We move to general business agenda, public hearings, assessments and improvements. Item 11 is confirmation of assessment role for street paving on Clover Hill Place and Dunwoody subdivision. Good evening, members of the council. Robert Joyner, Development Review, Public Works Department. Uh, this is item 11, confirmation of assessment role for street paving on Clover Hill Place in the Dunwoody subdivision. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, Cole McFadden, members of the council. Uh, item 11 is to conduct a public hearing and receive comments on the confirmation of the assessment role for street improvements that have been completed on Clover Hill Place in the Dunwoody subdivision. Staff recommends the confirmation of the assessment role as presented. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Would ask first other questions by members of the council. Uh, hearing none, is there anyone in the audience that wants to speak on this item? It's been a public hearing matter. Uh, let the record reflect no one else asked to speak. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matter of fact, for the council. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Item 12 is. Comprehensive Plan Amendment, Ellis Road, Residential, 813-000008. Good evening, <coughs> Mayor Bell and members of the Council, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, first, I could certify for the record that all public hearing items before you tonight have been advertised in accordance with the requirements of law, and uh, we have affidavits to that effect on file with the Planning Department. Uh, the case before you, as the Mayor introduced, A13-00008, is a plan amendment uh, by Teague Hankins Development to um, request amendment to the future land use map for approximately 15.5 acres from its current designation of low density residential uh, to low medium density residential. The site is located on the east side of Ellis Road uh, in the suburban tier north of Sohai Drive and south of Rada Drive. Uh, staff has determined that this request uh, meets the four criteria for plan amendments outlined in the UDO and staff therefore recommends approval of the request. The Planning Commission also recommended approval at its meeting of December 10th, 2013 by a vote of 12 to zero. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask first of the questions by members of the staff, members of the council of the staff person. Uh, if not, we had one person that has signed up to speak, Gerard Edens, is the president. Mr. you have three minutes initially. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Here representing my client, uh, Tom Hankins, with uh, Teague Hankins Development. As Pat stated, we've got a request before you to amend the future land use plan and later a request to amend the rezoning to allow development uh, on the Ellis Road. Uh, as the report mentions, the, the density we're requesting does provide a nice transition between the higher density apartments to the south and uh, the mainly single family communities that are north on Ellis Road. This site's very near uh, RTP as far as the southern end of Ellis Road. 
uh, does provide another housing option and we are committing to townhomes as part of the land use amendment and rezonings. It's another housing option in the area that doesn't currently exist in that immediate area. Uh, we held a neighborhood meeting on September 3rd. Uh, we had three people in attendance. We've had no opposition that I'm aware of to date. Uh, as Pat mentioned, we did receive un unanimous approval at Durham Planning Commission. Um, one thing that we, we did want to offer up tonight, uh, we noticed in the staff report that, I guess that's at the rezoning. I can uh, make that proffer, but I'll go ahead and proffer it now. We, we're offering uh, to offset the cost of the one additional student that will result from the land use amendment and the rezoning by offering to uh, contribute $500 to the school system. And my client will make that contribution, I believe it's prior to the first final plat for the project is the, been the way we've been handling those. Um, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is a public hearing matter. Are there persons that want to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect no one else has to speak. I'll declare a public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Uh, we'll move to item 13, zoning map change, Ellis Road Residential Z13000006026. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, this is the companion zoning case to the uh, comprehensive plan amendment case you just heard. Uh, same property, 15.53 acres at 1443 Ellis Road. Uh, the request is to rezone the property from its current designation of residential suburban or RS20 to plan development residential 7.341. Uh, this request is consistent with the future land use designation that you just adopted of low medium density residential. Uh, the current density would allow approximately 27 single family units uh, to be developed uh, in the county's jurisdiction if on site wells and wastewater systems could be accommodated. The proposed rezoning would allow the development of 90 townhouse units. The unit type is committed as the applicant told you in previous case. Um, the associated development plan includes a number of text and graphic commitments which are detailed in your staff report. Um, these include uh, one access point off of Ellis Road, cross access to the parcel to the north, uh, and one stream crossing would be committed. Also the applicant is committed to providing um, additional improvements to Ellis Road that would allow the accommodation of a bicycle lane as called for in the um, city's bicycle plan. Staff determines this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies, and uh, Planning Commission recommended approval at its December 10th meeting by a vote of 12 to 0. Um, and I did make note of the uh, commitment that was made by the applicant on the previous case, and we can certainly enforce and add that to this, to this case if it's your desire. Be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there questions by members of the council? Uh, again, we have Gerard Eden. Eden? No, no comments? Anyone else want to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect no one else has to speak. I'll uh, declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. I'm sorry. Uh, we, oh, sure. Thanks. I, actually, I was waiting for the public hearing before I came back to staff. So um, I wanted to ask uh, I note that on the development plan, there are steep slopes. Could you briefly tell me the impact of steep slopes on, the, like, are they developable, non-developable? There are regulations in the Unified Development Ordinance that within certain criteria, the steep slopes are not developable. Um, and I think the applicant did identify um, where those areas were. At the time of site plan, those will be field verified and identified on the site plan. Uh, and, and, and would not be developed if they meet the criteria in the UDO for, sleep, for steep slopes. Right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. We move to item 14, zoning map change for Crowsdale Commons, Z13000024. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, this case, uh, Z13000024, Crowsdale Commons, is a request to change the zoning designation of a 8.8-acre uh, .8 property located on a Hillendale Road, um, known as Crowsdale Commons, uh, from its existing zoning designation of Commercial Center, or CC, 
to the requested zoning designation of commercial general with the development plan CGD. Uh, this request is com consistent with the future land use map which identifies the property as commercial. Uh, the current zoning of CC uh, creates a limitation on the amount of office use allowed on the property and the applicant is seeking this zoning change to allow approximately 11,000 additional square feet of office use. Uh, staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adoptive policies and ordinances and the Planning Commission recommended approval at its December 10, 2013 meeting by a vote of 12 to 0. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Let me ask first of the questions by members of the council. I recognize Council Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I know, I know that there's not a bike lane on Front Street being provided, and I was just wondering, what are our rules and, and practices here uh, about that? Uh, Councilman Shull, typically what we do um, through the, our transportation department is if there are any access improvements, so driveway improvements, uh, ro return lanes, other roadway improvements, we request that um, bike lanes be provided if the a comprehensive bicycle pedestrian plan calls for them. Uh, typically, if there are not any associated access improvements, we, we don't ask for them because we don't think there's a close enough nexus, um, and, and, and that was the case here. Again, this is primarily just a, a minor, uh, would allow a minor addition of additional office use. Great, thank you. The only, only other thing I wanted to say, Mr. Mayor, is if I'm sure you all have been by this, this has already been redeveloped, and it's a very nice redevelopment. The shopping center uh, had been uh, uh, not as not redeveloped for a while, and uh, it looks great, and uh, it's wonderful to have those those uh, tenants in there, really great tenants. So, for those of us who are near neighbors, uh, it's it's really a nice addition. Period. Great. Thank you. Any other comments by members of the council? Uh, comments by members of the public? George Stanziel. George Stanziel with Stewart, um, 115 Cofield Circle in Durham. I'm just here for any questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I had a presentation. I won't bore you with it if you don't have questions. Are, are there other persons that want to speak on this item? Uh, if not, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. I would declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Move to item 15, United Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment Density Revisions to Article 6, TC 12-000012. Uh, thank you very much, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Text Amendment TC 120012 is a request by Horvath Associates to modify certain density standards within Article 6 of the Unified Development Ordinance, or UDO. Uh, the original proposal, as indicated in the attached application, uh, attachment A, uh, would have established a new roadway density bonus uh, for the suburban tier, similar to a roadway density bonus already established for the urban tier. At its May meeting, the Joint City County Planning Committee uh, discussed the proposed amendment application and afterwards uh, it, with additional staff review of the application and discussions with the applicant uh, came to the conclusion that the proposed uh, modifications uh, were not supportable due to not being able to guarantee how exactly uh, the bonuses would be used um, based upon the proposed application. Uh, subsequently there had been um, and as before you uh, revisions to that application and I'll just summarize them quickly. Uh, one, that they adjusted uh, just current density allowances to remove fractions. Uh, some of the density uh, corrections go up by half a unit per acre. Uh, some actually go down. Uh, modify the existing residential suburban uh, multifamily major roadway density bonus to include frontage along service roads. Uh, allow higher densities in the RSM uh, and RUM districts. Uh, but only with approval through a development plan. Increase the density of the residential compact or RC district to maintain consistency uh, with densities, higher densities allowed in the RUM and also in design districts that are currently within the UDO. And also allow uh, use of density bonuses for multifamily development in non-residential districts uh, in the suburban and compact neighborhood tiers consistent with how it's already applied for similar development in the urban tier. Um, all revisions were reviewed against the comprehensive plan and were deemed consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, these re 
revisions were presented again to the JCCPC for review and comment back on at its November 6th uh, meeting and no changes to the draft were suggested at that time. The Planning Commission held a public hearing on the text amendment on, at, on December 10th, 2013 and recommended approval 11 to 1. I'll be happy to answer any questions and the applicant is here to also to answer questions. Thank you. This is a public hearing. You've heard the staff report. Are there questions by members of the council? Uh, we have three people that have signed up to speak on this item. Four people. Uh, three is proponents, one is opponent. I'll call the proponents first, and you have ten minutes between the three of you Gerard Eaton, Joe Stanciel, and Ron Harbert. Mr. Mayor, Ron Horvath, members of the council, my name is Ron Horvath, uh, 16 Consultant Place. Um, I took on the task of this text amendment. Uh, the staff, as you are well aware, is overtasked, shorthanded, and underfunded on many items. And we've been discussing this in the next text amendment for uh, uh, some time. So right or wrong, I took it on. Uh, my main purpose is to encourage redevelopment of properties along our major thoroughfares, our roadway, our major roadways, 15501 Business and Bypass, Roxborough Road. I have a number of clients that are looking at redeveloping properties and being able to incorporate both residential into the commercial aspects of the property make it enticing for redevelopment. Um, if you carefully read this, I'm not asking for a change of rezoning. Plans that have a D on them still have to come back to you. Rezonings still have to come back to you for the higher densities. What I'm after is uh, in a general commercial zoning, uh, the maximum residential density right now is 10.5. I'm asking to go to 11. And I'm also asking that the same courtesy that's given to an RM zone that if they're along a major roadway, it'd be allowed to add one unit per acre, no more. But right now, the ordinance, if you're in the GC or OI zone, you're allowed to do residential, but there's no bonus. So all we're asking for here is that that bonus be applied both to the general commercial and the office institutional. Think of the mixed uses that can come out of that, old shopping centers, old office complexes. Now you tear them down and you rebuild and you have a mix of apartments housing, uh, commercial, and office. Um, while some consider this slight increase, this one to one and a half unit, uh, or even a half unit increase, too high for Durham, I counter that the adopted comprehensive plan says the suburban tier can support, uh, one of the ranges is eight to 20 units an acre. Our best is 10 and a half under a straight zoning. The best you can get is 10 and a half. The rounding up of the dense half unit per acre will not affect the current RM zones. I won't repeat myself again. The eight unit an acre stays eight unit an acre. The 12 unit an acre stays 12. We haven't made changes in the RM zones. This only really is occurring in the OI and the uh, general commercial zones. There may be some other changes in the RU that are occurring, but um, they are a uh, direct result of this, but it's, it, again, in the urban tier, I feel it's very, very viable. In my opinion, these changes to the residential density limits will help encourage redevelopment at the perimeter of the urban core. We're no longer suburban. We've got a large area that's borderline suburban, urban, and we're looking at trying to redevelop those areas and have them develop in a way that makes the current Durham County and Durham City tax base more viable. Thank you and I'll be available for any questions. We have also Gerard Edens and Joe Stanciel. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land Corp. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of the text amendment. I'm generally in favor of things that make sense and to me this makes sense. And we're, uh, what Ron is talking about is a, a very slight increase in density in areas where you could argue that, that we're aiming too low with the number. Uh, so I think this makes sense to me and I'm here to support it, thank you. You're welcome. George Stanziel. George Stanziel with Stuart. Um, 
you don't typically see Ron and I standing up here talking about the same thing, so it's kind of unique. I, the only thing I'd like to add is that, you know, even when our UDO was written, um, we were still thinking a whole lot in terms of sort of a suburban th way of thinking. And our suburban land is, we don't have a lot of it left. So the whole idea of redevelopment, making, you know, reusing buildings, adding to them, and creating density is going to encourage development. And uh, uh, I can tell you that a half a unit or a unit, we ought to be talking about a whole lot more than that, frankly, in the, in the urban core. We really should be talking about a lot more, you know, if we're going to encourage transit and, uh, you know, whatever, whatever level of transit we want to talk about. So as somebody that uses the ordinance that, that works with a lot of different developers, I, I, I completely agree you know, with this text amendment. Thank you. You're welcome. I recognize Ms. Patricia Carson. You have 10 minutes. I, I'm Pat Carstensen. Um, I'm representing the Interneighborhood Council of Durham. Uh, we sent you our resolution, which sort of does go on, and I'm not going to go through the details of it. Um, we really don't disagree with the proposal on the non-residential part, but the part on the residential part, um, a lot of the discussion that we had was we do support uh, density. Uh, we support density s that's smart, which means this, this density where people can walk from where they live to where they want to shop or where they want to be entertained or where they want to work. Uh, we uh, support it where we are al already doing uh, good transit and we are committed to doing better transit. So for example, at the Patterson Place, we would love to see more housing, uh, uh, dense den uh, housing near that. Um, but this is what you might call a loose cannon in that it will be able to shoot density wherever it wants to go, whether it's where it will be served by transit or where you will have people with that will be tr uh, s stranded with their cars at two parking places per unit wherever it wants to be. So I, we would like to, INC would like you to um, wait until we see how density is developing in other areas. We've already made a lot of commitment to density before you um, go with the, um, the, the residential parts of this proposal. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item uh, before I close the public hearing? Let the record reflect that no one else has to speak. I will close the public hearing the matters before the council. Before the item. Uh, I'm going to recognize Councilman Moffitt. Okay. So it's Hannah. Thank you. I have, um, I have just one concern, uh, which is that we're working on trying to find ways to encourage more affordable housing. And one of the things that I've heard is that our density bonuses don't work because there's already sufficient density to encourage development. I mean, that's been sort of one of the understandings that I've had. And, and through this ordinance change, we're talking about ways to increase. And if I'm, if I'm doing apples and oranges, you can tell me that. But it looks like we're looking at ways to increase density which seems like it would make it even more difficult to encourage affordable housing. And I'm just wondering if you can talk me down here, convince me that I'm wrong. Um, I, I will give it a shot, and the uh, planning director will gladly step in where I'm not being sufficient. Um, but uh, th there is sort of two different things going on here. Um, there's a whole separate project, as you're aware of, for studying affordable housing, the current affordable housing density bonus, which is a completely different uh, methodology in terms of uh, the amount of density you get. Um, and that is also based upon um, uh, the, the density that you're allowed under your current provision. So any increase in density is actually only going to, even if it's a minimal amount, only going to help any affordable housing density bonus because they can, any density bonuses can be used in, uh, together or cumulative. Um, but 
the discussion really with affordable housing is going to go much beyond just density. It's going to look at a lot of different tools uh, needed to encourage or, or support affordable housing. So this this is something that's, uh, that came about um, uh, separate from the affordable housing discussion. I don't, and I don't know if that actually addressed your question adequately enough. I mean, uh, so the, 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 the one thing I wanted to ask about was you said that more density makes it easier for the bonus because they can get even more. But what I was thinking was if 100 units, if they're not interested in an uh, affordable housing density bonus because 100 units, for example, is sufficient, and now we're saying now you can do 105 units before you even have to start thinking about bonuses for affordable housing. And they were already happy with 100. I'm not sure how that makes it easier. And I, all I, want, I guess really, what I'm really asking is that for the staff to say, look, we looked at this with affordable housing in mind, and either we did, this is exactly what we came up with, was it makes it better, or we realize that the affordable housing density bonuses are useless and they have no impact, or something like that. Um. Good evening, Steve Madlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. Uh, not to put it too fine of a point on the, mo uh, the, 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 the comment that you just made, Council Member Moffitt. In fact, the density bonuses that we currently have in the Unified Development Ordinance are not workable. We recognize that. Uh, we recognize that density alone is not going to necessarily drive affordable housing. There are a lot of other elements that have to come into play. Uh, what we did do when we were taking a look at this text amendment is make sure that whatever we do is not going to work adversely to our ability to provide affordable housing through other mechanisms that we're working on, as you're familiar. Um, that includes allowing for increased density, but also other incentives that we're going to be looking to use to help offset the cost of providing affordable housing uh, within our targeted areas. And that may be any range of things, including uh, modifying our development standards, uh, parking standards, things of that nature that decrease the overall costs associated with providing affordable housing. And I think that's going to carry the ball further than uh, focusing solely on density. Oh, Recognize Councilwoman Katati. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to ask staff if you could also um, clarify again where the density bonus applies to essentially address Ms. Karstensen's concern about going wherever. I think it's actually much more limited than that. No, the, den um, the, the density bonus, the modifications for any of the existing density bonuses, the, the only real uh, change is to the current RSM density bonus, which allows a one unit per acre bonus, and we're adding the ability for um, along service roads, and that was act and we've actually modified that since planning commission based upon comments we received from Ms. Carstensen about access to that service road. So we br built in provisions that you had to have access to that service road to actually take advantage of that. Uh, the other bonuses built in, uh, well, they're not really bonuses, but the um, modification of the fractions ups it a half unit at most uh, per acre, so that's one unit over two acres. Um, and the other additional increases that are proposed uh, for, say, the RSM and RUM districts are just basically you're increasing what uh, someone could ask for. It still has to be approved through a development plan. Mm -hmm. And just for clarification, and come back to us for approval. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Recognize Councilman Davis. Um, the, the question that um, Councilmember Katati just asked may take care of what I'm uh, concerned about, but uh, did I get gather from uh, Ms. Carson that one aspect of the proposal, she's asking that one aspect be delayed, or is she talking about more than that? I direct your question to I guess to staff or to Ms. She's here. We're pretty we're pretty much okay with the non-residential part. It's the other three that we have problems with. And I guess to follow up on that, Mr. Mayor, uh, what would be the impact of delaying that aspect of it?
direction as to, or policy direction as, as you'd like staff to see, take with us. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that. I mean, I think that that's right. Without some direction from the council, I don't know what referring back to staff where right. that would really get us. I think we'd, we'd probably come right back to where we are because that's the staff recommendation without okay. without more definitive information or direction. Right, thank you. Any, any further questions, comments? It was just a motion by C. Councilman Moffat's hand also. I just want to make a one a quick comment. I want to appreciate uh, both um, Ron Harbath and Associates for stepping in and helping draft this because our staff is overburdened. And I also want to appreciate all of the citizens who've worked on this in their own time uh, to help improve it and strengthen it. And, um, and I just really appreciate everyone's input. Thanks. Thank you. We had a motion. We didn't get a second. second. It's been properly moved and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, call the question. Madam Clerk. Will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Item 16, Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment Tree Coverage Calculations. Thank you again, Michael Stock again with the Planning Department. Uh, text Amendment TC 13002 is a text amendment uh, again submitted by Horvath Associates to amend a method of calculating requ uh, required tree coverage areas uh, pursuant to Section 8.3 tree, tree Protection and Tree Coverage of the Unified Development Ordinance or UDO. Uh, the original proposal uh, as seen in Attachment A uh, in your packets by the applicant would remove proposed to remove areas within most easements and stormwater facilities uh, from the overall development area, and that is the area used for which uh, calculating tree coverage area uh, requirements are based upon. Uh, after review uh, and comment by staff, the applicant revised the proposal to limit the exemption to area with uh, only within area uh, within existing utility easements of record uh, with a minimum of 50 feet in width. Uh, currently, tree coverage is required uh, in the suburban tier and only for residential development in the urban tier. No tree coverage requirements do apply in the rural compact neighborhood or downtown tiers. Uh, the UDO also currently provides two exemptions uh, for tree coverage calculations. That's for existing water bodies uh, and rights of way dedication uh, for widening existing right of way. Uh, this text amendment would add a third exemption, uh, again, only which would exclude existing utility easements measuring 50 feet in width or greater. Uh, at its October meeting, the JCCPC did review this text amendment and indicated no concerns with the proposal. Uh, the Planning Commission held a public hearing on the text amendment uh, on November 12th and recommended approval with a unanimous vote. Again, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and the applicant is here to also answer questions. Thank you very much. You have the staff report. Are there questions? This is a public hearing. Anyone if you recognize the per person? I have a comment on one of the people that signed up, but I can, I'll do this at the end. We have um, three persons that are signed up to speak in support. We have three persons that are signed up to speak in opposition. Uh, recognize the proponents first and uh, limit your time to 10 minutes initially. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the Council, Ron Horvath again. Um, let me start by saying I started this text amendment um, eight months after the other one. How they ended up in the same night, I'm baffled. But with this one, Steve and Patrick and I have been discussing this very text amendment for over two years. And Steve said, yeah, on our next big rollout, we'll look at this and, and make modifications. Well, it, I had four projects in the last five years that had this issue. So again, no good deed goes unpunished. I decided to file the text amendment and, and uh, assist staff. And I, uh, I asked for everything. And staff, and particularly Steve, called me up and said, you're not getting everything. This is involved in extremely large easements, uh, power lines, gas lines, et cetera. And best example I can use, most of those are in a 50 to 60 foot easement across a piece of property. It used to be under the UD or under the zoning ordinance in I think 
the initial UDO that you could plant some of your trees under there, the smaller ones that the power company allowed. So it wasn't a major problem. Well, then the power company came out, particularly on the large ones, and said, uh, yeah, you can plant them, but we can't guarantee them. Agent Orange was sprayed over the entire right of way, and all the trees would be dead, and staff ended up changing the ordinance to say, you can't count it. You can't plant trees there. And I understand that fully. I'm, I totally am supportive of that. But they had two exemptions in this. Ponds, because you don't build on ponds and you don't plant trees there, and uh, uh, lakes, and then right-of-way dedications for road widening, both places that you can't do additional tree planting. They took that area, the gross land area, to calculate your tree preservation. Now, utility easements like this do allow road crossings, generally around 90 degrees, but you're not allowed to parallel them and fill them in. They do allow play areas, so they're grass, and if they don't spray them, we'll be able to use them for recreation areas. Limited parking, they allow some parking fields on them, but in a limited nature. And very limited for BMPs. I can put my slopes into them, but I can't put the actual stormwater ponds in the easement. So there's nothing I'm allowed to really put in there, including lots or buildings. Um, so what we came up with was take an easement, if it's 150 feet wide, subtract 50 feet, and then the remaining 100 foot you could get uh, reduced from your um, gross land area in your calculation. The Dell Webb project, Carolina Arbors, you're very familiar with, and that's the one that set me off when I finally, about eight months ago, realized where we were on it. The right-of-way is 350 feet wide, traverses this site, and this occurs in a lot of vacant property over in that section of Durham. You'll be seeing this come up more often. 350 feet wide, it's 27 acres of land. The tree replacement is seven and a half acres I gotta put someplace outside of the right of way. Those numbers started generating with me and that's why I filed this uh, text amendment. We're not asking for the entire right of way to be exempt. I'm not asking for anything beyond a reasonable use of the land, which is I can't plant trees, I can only plant grass. So I ask your support in this text amendment tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Eaton, this is to go speak on this, and George Stansiel. Yes, uh, thank you, Jared Eaton's. Um, again, I'm here in support of uh, the text memo that Ron's proposing. Ron's much older and much wiser than me, so I have to support Ron uh, just by nature. But uh, I do want to point out that um, maybe maybe an out of the box thinking, but. You know, tr tree coverage is not always tree preservation. A lot of times it's plantings. And one of your more expensive items you run into when you're working up a site development cost for a developer is plantings. And plantings are very expensive. Um, this would slightly reduce what that cost would be. And cost of a project directly relates to the affordable housing possibilities on a project, just tying that together. I love Durham. I'm a Durham cheerleader. Anyone, anyone who asks me, I say I love Durham. It's where I want to work. But Durham's an expensive place to work. And whenever there are expenses that are associated with development, including tree coverage, um, it eventually it all falls down to the end user. It, it's just a simple economics. So that's the only small point I would like to make. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Uh, George Stanziel. George Stanziel with Stewart. I'm really, as a landscape architect, very impressed that these civil engineers have come up here asking for landscape kinds of stuff. So that's really cool. Um, what I guess the, the point that I would want to make uh, in support of this is that um, land is getting extremely expensive. Um, we don't have a lot of it left that is of any quality, to be honest with you. The, the land that we do have is very challenging with steep slopes, and, and, and particularly if you're talking about a project that, um, uh, that Ron, like Ron was talking about, you typically will have a, a may, I, a, v a major <coughs> easement that runs across it. I can't think of many projects that I've done that are large pieces of land that didn't have some major easement running across it. Housing is um, on the up again. 
I just came back from a, a Urban Land Institute meeting in, in Charlotte. Housing is starting to roar again, but land prices are up. Housing uh, lots are getting smaller. Houses are getting smaller. And um, the, the ability to utilize the amount of land that we do have on a piece of property is very critical. And so this really gets down to cost. I mean, it's not so much the cost of planting plants in these, in these areas of tree coverage. It really gets down to what is actually usable on a piece of property uh, after you apply buffers and tree coverage and, and those kinds of things. Um, so, I, you know, I think what, what Ron and, and staff have, have uh, suggested makes a lot of sense. Um, you're probably not going to find these on a lot of projects, uh, these very, very wide ones like he's talking about, like on the Dell Webb, um, but from time to time you do, and it has a very, very major impact on uh, the financial, a, a big financial impact on, on a project and uh, the actual usable acreage. Uh, and I say usable acreage because to plant uh, either, to either keep or plant tree save area, you're taking up developable area. So, uh, you know, again, I, you know, this, this goes to our, uh, you know, sort of more urban way of thinking. Durham is urban now. And, um, uh, and I, I completely agree with this, with this text amendment. Thank you. Welcome. Um, we have three people who have signed sign up to speak in opposition, and I'll call their names, Robert Healy, Patricia Carson, and Will Wilson. And again, opponents have six minutes, have 10 minutes among the speakers. Uh, City Council, thank you. Uh, council members and mayor and staff, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Will Wilson, uh, 16 Sunny Oaks Place. Um, first of all, tree coverage is not about trees. This is a public health issue. Trees in, uh, urban trees reduce temperatures, they improve air quality, and reduce respiratory health issues. So we're talking about a public health issue. You know, you don't get a flu shot because you like shots. You get a flu shot because you want to re remove a communicable disease, right? We get tree coverage in urban areas so that we have better health. Um, now, in fact, the EPA is developing in the RTP uh, a new tool called the Enviro Atlas. Uh, I'm not sure about the name, but it's got more than 75 uh, benefits of trees, uh, census track by census track uh, in Durham. And these include things like the annual number of acute respiratory system cases avoided by ozone, particulate matter, PM 2.5, which now has new uh, EPA regulations on it that we have uh, been exceeding asthma exacerbation, and all of these are measured by uh, reductions in public health problems due to tree coverage, uh, census track by census track, and uh, it also uh, deals with uh, uh, poverty issues. Um, so this information needs to be also the foundation of our open or urban open space plans that we're de developing. Um, and now with respect to the tax amendment itself, um, let me just read my, what I've ascertained from communications with uh, planning director C. Medlin. Um, the simplest statement of this change is that presently developers move both imperviousness allowances and tree coverage requirements from the easement area to the remainder of the parcel, right? So the, the, the easement goes through your parcel, you get credit for e uh, imperviousness over where you can build it. Um, likewise, you have to build the trees, put the trees where outside that easement. So um, the, this developer-initiated proposed change relieves the developer of the tree coverage requirement, but still the developer retains the uh, ability to have the impervious surface calculated on the basis of the entire parcel area. What that's doing is increasing the relative amount of imperviousness 
to tree coverage, which is going to increase the urban temperatures and decrease air quality and increase the public health problems. Um, now, you know, you could, uh, beyond that, they could also seek rezoning to get higher levels of density in that area with even lower tree coverage. So the health problems will be even worse. So, so the effect of this uh, text amendment um, is that we'll develop neighborhoods with these easements that have lower tree coverage per capita than similarly zoned areas of the city. And so uh, on the basis of this, I, re uh, I urge you to reject the, this text amendment. Welcome, uh, Robert Healy. Good evening, I'm uh, Bob Healy. I live at uh, 839 Sedgefield. Uh, at least seven of us, all of us active in land use planning in Durham for many years and sustainable development have gone back and forth on this and exchanged at least 50 emails trying to understand what the impact would be. Uh, looking at it, uh, we do think that some of the impetus for this are people who have problems, specific problems with the application uh, of this provision. And uh, we wonder why, if they have specific problems, they don't seek to have their specific property rezoned in such a way that will accommodate their, their desires. And we think that uh, perhaps they're looking for a general solution because they would have a weak case in the case of a specific. Uh, for example, they'd have to explain, as Will pointed out, why they want to include the property in an easement for purposes of calculating density, but not include it for purposes of calculating tree cover. Uh, so rather than argue the merits of the individual case, they are seeking a general uh, change in the rule. Now, we do know that changing ru general rules can lead to serious and uh, unanticipated consequences. And frankly, in going back and forth with these 50 emails, we couldn't figure out exactly what this was going to do. So we would like to ask Steve Medlin or any other member of the planning department who may be present the following question. Given that this is a request for a tax amendment affecting the entire county, are you prepared this evening to show the council and the public on maps all of the properties that would be affected by the change and whether or not these properties are near major streams, parks, or areas identified in the natural heritage inventory? Specifically, how would the text change affect New Hope Creek, LRB Creek, and the Eno River? all of which we observe have high power tension lines nearby, often in more than one place. Uh, if they can't do that and really tell us what this would do and tell you what it would do, we respectfully ask that the matter be returned by council to the planning commission, which did not have access to this specific information. Uh, so this important matter can be analyzed and debated and then considered. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, uh, I've always had a problem with that part of the UDO because I don't know whether you can see the picture, but this is what I've always had as the image of having a nice pond and one little scrawny tree. And what I've been told is that generally what you have is a very small pond and a big acreage, so it's a very small decrease in the amount of the tree coverage. So I would like to understand, are there places where it'd be a significant decrease in the, in the acreage, in, in the tree coverage? So if you, are you losing two trees or are you losing three quarters of the trees when you don't need to have the trees in there? So I would like to have the planning department come up with a uh, study about are there places where a significant amount of trees would be, the, the tree coverage would be decreased significantly. I also think that if you're allowing the tree coverage along a power line, you're setting yourself up for like generations of people complaining about the, uh, power, the, the power company butchering their trees. 
So you should probably try to back some of the tree coverage off the power line easement. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, is anyone else? You have come in there, Pro Tem. Uh, Mr. Mayor, earlier tonight, uh, Mr. John Tarantino approached me about adding an item to the agenda because they wanted to sing a song. I said that it is not uh, proper protocol to add an item and uh, that he should probably go to, you know, try to put it on work session. So what he has done is signed up to do, um, um, to um, sing on this item. And I'm not exactly sure. I mean, he's just playing games. I just want to let the council know what I had shared with them and what he decided to do to have his way tonight. Thank you. Let, let, let's let's do this. Um, we we're still in, we're still we're still we're still in a, a public hearing. Uh, we've had from the proponents and opponents. Let me ask the other people who want to speak, either proponent or opponent, on this item. Speak, not sing. No. If, uh, uh, Mr. Tarantino, if you want to speak on this item, are you for or against the item? I just need to know: Are, are you are you are you speaking for or against? I up as a supporter of the. You, you want to speak in support of this of item. In support of the development. Mr. With, a with a friendly with a friendly. No, do Do you want to speak on this item, in support of it? If you do. With a friendly word of caution, Mayor. That's what I was going go, to do. Go ahead and speak. You have. It doesn't have to you, be musical. No, are, are you opponent? I just want to make sure. I was supporting it with a friendly word of okay, caution. Okay, how, how much time do proponents have? I think it was two minutes, Mr. Thir Martin. I mean, 30 yeah. seconds is enough. All right, Mr. It Tarantino, Mr. Don't, Tarantino don't, you, sir. you got the mic. Go ahead. It doesn't have to be musical. I could do it musical. No, I could do it without Yeah, You have the mic. So this is a, a, a rephrasing of some words that was once performed by uh, Miss Joni Mitchell, and it's regarding number 16. It's not the, the, not the song that I'm going to do on Thursday. And it has, it has to do with this. They paved paradise and cut back the vegetation, lessened the easement restrictions via tree cover calculations. Don't it, don't, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? They paved paradise via tree cover calculations. That's all I wanted to say. It's just a little philosophical comment and a social comment, which I thought as a citizen I was allowed to do. But you, I think. You, you, you just did. I think. I think that um, the other motive was mis misunderstood by Ms. Ms. McFadden. But I'll see you on Thursday with the thing that I applied for on Thursday. All right. Thank you. Let thank me you. Ask thank you, Mayor. You thank you, Mr. Are, are there other persons that want to speak on this item, either for or against? If if not, I'm going to close the public hearing and the matter is back before the council. Recognize Councilwoman Katani. Thank you, Mayor. I was just going to ask staff if they could address some of the concerns that have been raised, particularly regarding the imperviousness allowance and adjustments to calculations and what the impacts might be. Uh, good evening, Steve Medlin, again with the Planning Department. Um, in terms of impervious surface, uh, by ordinance, any track or development project basically is entitled to uh, take credit for the full acreage or, or square footage of that tract. Obviously, as you all are aware, we do have impervious surface limitations throughout the city and county of Durham, uh, with two-thirds of the city and county being in watershed protection areas. Uh, obviously, those areas are limited in terms of the total impervious surfaces. In fact, as I think Mr. Wilson indicated, it is possible to transfer impervious surfaces from easement areas, uh, or excuse me, pervious areas, if you will, uh, from those, uh, those easements to, uh, to offset the, the overall impervious uh, surface impacts of any development on the overall tract. Uh, one point of clarification, I think there may be some, some uh, confusion about what is actually permissible within the easements themselves. I want to be very clear that basically most of the easements that we have that are greater than 50 feet in width basically preclude the ability to put trees in there. Uh, so all trees would have to be outside any of those easement areas put onto the, for lack of a better description, the more developable portion of the tract. Um, I know there has been some comments about density. Uh, just want to, to clarify that uh, obviously to transfer densities that would in fact require a rezoning of the property to a zoning district. 
that would allow for uh, like a PDR or even a RUM or RSM uh, district that would allow for densities to be done on an overall track basis. Uh, single family zoning districts like an RR, RS20, RS10, uh, you are not allowed to do those transfers. And that's, that's a, a key here. Uh, obviously, as Mr. Horvath indicated in his comments, most of the projects that you see come before you that will probably be impacted by these types of easements will come forward as a rezoning, uh, more than likely to a planned density residential district, uh, much like uh, the case in point that Mr. Horvath uh, mentioned, which is the, uh, the Dell Webb project in East Durham. Uh, if you can remember that project, uh, as he indicated, a good portion of that was actually impacted. I didn't realize it was 27 acres, to be honest with you. Uh, of area within the easement that obviously had to be offset by tree coverage areas outside of that. Uh, obviously that's a large percentage considering that uh, typically if you're doing retained tree coverage you're looking at 20 percent retained tree coverage. If you have to plant it then it goes up uh, slightly above that. Uh, so you're looking at at least one-fifth of any development project that will be required to have tree coverage on it regardless. Um, in terms of Mr. Healy's question to me, I would like to respond to that if I can very quickly. We have not done a parcel by parcel analysis. That obviously is just not something that uh, we anticipated that would be needed and it had not been requested uh, before. We did do some isolated um, project evaluations and determined that what we felt like uh, what was being requested was reasonable. Yes, ma'am. Did you finish? Yes, yeah, Councilman Marcus. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Medlin. Uh, um, regarding density, if I have a and, and, uh, if I have a PDR rezoning currently, and it's got an easement running across it, am I able to transfer that density? Am I able to use the if if these changes are adopted, would I be able to use the power line easement to meet your density? as part of the calculation for the PDR density? You, you currently can. Uh -huh. And I want to be very clear, we're not changing those requirements, and, and that's pretty much what happened with But, but the currently, you also have the tree, so what we've done is we've removed, I'm sorry to interrupt you. you. No, no, please. Okay, so um, what I understand then is, is that what's being proposed is that we take out the tree coverage uh, requirement, but allow density and impervious surfaces to be calculated continuing to be calculated using the easement. Using the overall track acreage, including the easement, that is correct. Right. D did the, and I, I recognize that, uh, that this was drafted uh, by, a, by a private shop in order to assist the, the department. Um, did you all consider the issue of density and impervious surface in, in reflecting on this? I mean, I'm, because I, to me it seems, one, the one solution might be to say, look, you, either the, for purposes of calculations affecting the site, mm -hmm. the easement is part of the property or it's not part of the property. And, um, but it seems like right now, from my very uh, uninformed perspective, it seems like it's only taken out of the calculations when it's, um, uh, when it benefits the applicant, but left in uh, when leaving it in benefits the applicant. It seems like the best of both worlds. I'm just. Um, we didn't consider it in that aspect, but we have take, took a look at other uh, current ordinance regulations that do impact how you calculate density, such as um, a lot of the environmental protection um, beyond tree coverage, uh, such as floodplain or even stream buffers or even steep slopes, for instance, do put limitations on, on the land that's within those areas as to how you put that towards density. So those already actually restrict uh, the application of that land towards your, your density calculations. So we did take a look at how that was in play, but we didn't take a look at the, um, the impervious surface or, or just an overall density calculation. Mm -hmm. Councilman Marcus, did you finish? Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I, I'm learning a lot of things. Um, ha, um, is it normal for private groups to make recommendations um, uh, instead of the staff uh, for these kinds of text amendments? 
Steve Medlin again with the planning department. Uh, the short answer is that uh, privately initiated text amendments are infrequent, but we do get them periodically. Uh, the Unified Development Ordinance actually has a provision that allows for any person uh, to submit a text amendment for consideration. So what has come before you is, while maybe not overly routine, is permissible by law. David said you finished? Yes, sir. Councilman Brown, followed by Councilman Shule. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ron, could you please come to the podium? I have one question for you. Could you uh, <coughs> give us again, you mentioned the Dell Webb yep. project in East Durham. Uh, if what you are posing would have been in effect, what difference would that have made in that project? If you remember, I've been before you for several rezonings that added property to the Dale Webb project. Well, part of that was to cover this additional tree replacement area. We actually bought more land to cover it. So that's a couple of the rezonings that I brought back several times to add more property to it. One of the issues we had with it, and this isn't just Dell Webb, I can, like I said, go through several projects, but Don, if, may I just answer Don's one question? Don, if we take the easement out of the property and I still am allowed to build 1,300 residential units somewhere within this, forget the easement, 1,300 is what was approved by the council. I still, on where the houses are being built, that property still has 20 plus percent tree coverage. It's still meeting the minimum requirements of the ordinance, 20 to 24 percent. So it's not a reduction, but we're being asked to take property from the easement, seven acres, put it into that, and not build any houses there. And we we're actually will have more like 26, 27 percent tree coverage instead of the 20 to 24. That's the numbers. That's why the density transfer really isn't part of the equation. But uh, Councilman Brown, to answer your question, yes, during the rezoning we had uh, concept di or designs and we figured out with lot sizes and road layouts and had it all figured, and it was enough. And when we got, we had talked to Duke Power and they at that time said we could put the water quality basins in the easement, as long as they weren't where their towers were gonna be. Well, the merger occurred between Duke and um, Carolina Power. Or Progress Energy, thank you. I've been around here too long. <laughs> the rules changed again. And the only thing we can do with our BMPs is have the side slopes go into the easement. So they've now been pushed out. So this is just one. I've, I've done several commercial projects where these easements have come through and it takes up buildable area where shops could go. And the same for some office buildings. So I'm not trying to get, I love the tree protection ordinance. I did some of the first subdivisions in Durham along with George and back then, you were only required to put one little tree on a whole block. And I can take you to a subdivision that I worked on where the owner said, well, I'm not required to, I'm not going to. And then as the subdivision developed, there were three changes in the ordinance requiring more trees and more trees and more trees. You can tell going neighborhood to neighborhood what time it was built in. So we've got a great ordinance. Don't get me wrong, this isn't weakening it. This is just trying to make it a more level playing field. That's all I'm asking. I hope that answered your question, Eugene. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, It seems to me, Mr. Horvath, that, that uh, Carolina Arbors is a smashingly successful it is. project and, and done under the current guidelines. 
Yes, it is. Um, I've been happy to vote for it on several occasions. Um, and I think that I, if, I had to, if I'm to understand this, that the basically, uh, as I understood your, your emails, which I appreciated, thank you, and, and I want to say your emails and also the emails from uh, Will Wilson and others, it's been, a, it's been a education for me and I appreciate it. Um, but as I understood it, you had to dedicate an additional 5.5 5 .5 acres more than you would have for tree coverage be, because of the situation, uh, 6.5 acres versus one or something in that area. Correct. And, and how big is the hole? Oh, uh, it's, it's large. It's 400 and some acres. Yeah. But so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with, I, I can understand what the public interest in the trees is. I can understand what the private interest of the developer is in having less tree coverage, but I'm having a, struggling with trying to figure out <clears throat> what the public interest would be with the less tree coverage. So help me. Let's take a smaller site. Let's do a 20 acre parcel of land that has a power line easement cutting through it 350 feet wide. Now that same land area, it eats up most of the property. You do have a little bit developable property left. There's very little they're going to be able to do with that. If you amass a large track, it's easier to absorb, which we have for the most part. We're not in dire needs. We, we've absorbed most of it by the additional land they bought. But there are a lot of parcels out there in East Durham that you're going to be seeing over the next couple of years from US 70 to the Wake County line that this power line is going to be drastically affecting. And not all of them are 400 acres. They're going to be 20, 30, 40 acres. And big swaths cut out of the middle of them. And they'll still need tree preservation areas. And it goes into developable areas. So it seems to me that if you had that particular situation, you could come to us and ask for um, a change on a particular project? Uh, I don't think the council can grant a variance in the UDO on tree coverage. So, um, the question was, can the council grant a variance for tree coverage on a site-by-site -site basis? Um, no. Uh, the short answer is the only body that has the ability to grant a variance to the, uh, any requirement of the Unified Development Ordinance is the Board of Adjustment. Okay. In that case, so they'd have to identify it as a hardship, I would assume, and not just... That, that is correct. The manager is absolutely correct. Uh, in order to be granted a variance, you have to show it's a hardship, not of your own making. I think it would be extremely difficult for correct. the board to find the necessary findings of fact in order to grant a variance. Thank you. So here's my concern. Uh, I can see why that would be a problem for a small piece of land. And so maybe we needed a uh, text amendment that deals with a small piece of land because I'm not very sympathetic to the idea that for a very large piece of land with a very large easement that we would want to reduce the uh, tree coverage, um, well, that we wouldn't want to count that uh, for purposes of the tree coverage. Um, I've, uh, so uh, I, could, I, I'm, I wouldn't be averse to voting for something that was about those smaller pieces of land, I could see that, that there is a public interest there. But it's hard pressed, I'm hard pressed to say that universally I would want to support that because I think that we're going to have some other quite large projects, I'm, I'm guessing, that would be in the same situation and I don't want to lose that tree coverage. So that's where, what I'm thinking at this, at this point. Do you have any other thoughts about that? Uh. Councilman Shule, the only thing I could say is I brought this forward not just because of Dell Webb, but by the other projects that have been hampered by it. It did cut into how much land could be, the developable land could be used. Um, I just considered it, if we're exempting ponds, lakes, stuff that we want there, road right away dedication, easements, utility easements like this, large ones, we're not even saying the small ones, 50 feet, the standard ones, we have to count them. But outside of that, we, it puts us at a 
disadvantage to other developments within that same context. We're having to plant or preserve trees on property that's developable. And as George said, we're running out of it. It's, it's disappearing very fast. Well, as I say, I, I, first of all, I'm not, I, you know, thank you for bringing it forward. I have no problem that you did that. And, and I think uh, my colleague raised a, a great question because we don't see many of these uh, Understood. privately. But I, I do think, I know there's some feeling that we should never be looking at these, uh, these, these uh, possible UDO changes uh, individually. And I, I'm, that is, I, I don't believe that. I think that there are times where it is very appropriate and I appreciate you bringing it forward. I could, I, I, I feel that I could support this in another form, but I don't think for, uh, uh, for the universal coverage that this would provide that, that I could support it. At this okay. time. Thank you. Recognize the mayor pro tem and council I'd like Mark. to ask Mr. Healy to come back. Thank you, sir. Sir, could you share again what your recommendation was? You said to send it back to the Planning Commission and- We don't, that's a good question. We do not know where these power lines are and how they relate to lands we want to protect. And just from visual observation, there are large power lines near the Eno River Park, near New Hope Creek, and Ellerby Creek. And we also, the, the, the water line easements, we do not know where they are. So what we're doing is, what we're being asked to do is to make a change that could affect very significant local resources, and yet we have no idea. They say, we'll just take the big ones, and there's not many of them. But all right, so where are they, and how do they relate to properties that might be developed? I think once that is done, and this is something for planning commission, not council, I think then they can go over it and say, yeah, this is starting to make sense, or no, this is going to result in a whole lot of exemptions for tree cover right next to the very places that we have worked so hard and spent so much money to protect. Okay. So that's the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Medlin. How much staff time is involved with this um, request? Um, how much time has been spent I mean, on this request so well, far? How much more time do you have? <laughs> um, uh, I think one of the questions might be, is that, is that an appropriate uh, follow-up for Thank staff you. or a follow-up for the petitioner? I think, thank you, Mr. Manager. I actually think that uh, if that is the desire of council, that we would actually deflect that back to the applicant to do that research and provide that information. Um, it's certainly not something that we in the planning department are currently capable of taking on in addition to our, to our other work program items. Uh, but if that is the desire of council, that would be my recommendation. Recognize Council Mark. First, I have, a, I have a question for Mr. Horvath, if you would. I appreciate it. Um, when you were answering uh, Councilman Brown's question and then mine, the, you mentioned that uh, one impact of this was that Del Webb had to acquire additional properties, and then you said that even uh, that there's 26 to 27 percent tree coverage. Is that with the additional property that you had to purchase because yes. of the easement issue? So, absent that extra property, you know, if you, if the, if if the proposal that we have in front of us was in place today, what, what would the percentage of tree coverage be then? Uh, the 20 to 24 percent. Okay. It would, it would comply with the ordinance. It's, I'm just saying right now we're doing more. We're providing more tree coverage in the area of the housing outside the easement mm -hmm. than what the UDO requires or dictates. Right. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I want to say, um, Council Member Shul, um, I was thinking about your issue of small tracks, large tracks, and thinking about one possible way of solving that problem without, we could base it on a track size. We could also base it on the, pers the impact of the easement on the tract. For example, if the easement was more than 30% of the tract. So, um, or some number, which I don't know what that number might be. The, 
as far as the rarity of seeing this, the, one of the cases we heard tonight has a 65 foot wide easement running across it. So in, in tonight, it was, you know, already, it, it's in front of us. So um, it's just a thought in terms of how that might be addressed. Okay, are there further questions, comments by staff members on this item? I recognize Councilwoman Katati. I don't know if staff's in a position to address any of Councilman Moffitt's comments in terms of talking about proportion of a site or uh, acreage. Are any of those, do they strike you as feasible? And would that merit further study in a limited fashion? Um, Steve Madlin. Again, um, to be very blunt, we have not evaluated either a minimum acreage size or percentage of coverage, uh, but certainly it is something that we could take a look at to, to do some modeling to see what would be reasonable. Um, we can work with the, the applicant in this case uh, to have them do some of the mapping for us. Um, I'm sure Mr. Horvath would be willing to commit some of his staff resources for that. Um, I, I think it is reasonable probably to consider establishing a acreage threshold because it would be a whole lot easier just off the cuff to uh, apply versus a percentage of coverage of an easement on a parcel. Um, I think it would get to the concerns that I heard raised this evening by uh, Council Member Shull, I think, to some degree. Uh, and I think it's uh, uh, certainly... Uh, something that can probably be prepared fairly fairly quickly uh, and within an, probably 90 days. Let, let me, uh, so I do want to bring this to a close. I know it's, I know it's important. Uh, I, I cannot support the ordinance the way it's written. I, I think there are still too many questions uh, that I like to have answers for. Uh, but by the same token, I don't want to put this council, specifically myself, in a position that if we choose to have the developer do more work, then that automatically assumes we're going to support it. So I, I just want to make sure that's clear. But I, I can't support it the way it is, but I would like, like to recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Could we just continue this item for maybe three cycles so that you can? Certainly, that is the prerogative of the council if you wish to continue the item cycles. for three cycles, and we can report back at that time. What, what's the pleasure of the council on this? I, I closed the public hearing on this, I, Steve. I closed the public hearing on this item. Now I can reopen it, and how, if if the council wants to extend, how, what's the best way to do that? I, I would suggest that you reopen the public hearing and continue it to a date specific. Right. So uh, the public hearing is still open. Now I recognize comments. Are there a motion? I just want to. Oh, I was going to move that we uh, continue uh, the hearing for three cycles. That was... Steve, is that... Steve, is that adequate time to bring um, something that's palatable? I, I would actually prefer to get a little longer time frame, at least four, four to five cycles, yes. I rescind that. I'll do it again. Could we suggest the beginning of May, perhaps the first work session in May? May? Okay. No, first. So what do I need to do to? But before you make the motion, I want okay. to recognize Councilman Shule. He'd raised okay. his hand before. Okay. okay. May? Okay. okay. Sure. So if it came back to a work session and we made recommendations, would it need to go back to Planning Commission? Would that be a significant change? I'm just wondering about timing. Gen generally speaking, as long as you're not diminishing the strength of the ordinance, um, and certainly the attorney can correct me if, I, if he feels I have this wrong, but typically you have the ability to modify the ordinance uh, unless it's significantly different, and I think that you yourselves would probably refer it back if you felt it was significantly different. Can, can the staff tell us can Steph tell us a, a recommended time frame for us to come back if we're going to do this? Uh, we're going to take a look at the uh, calendars and to meet an agenda deadline of uh, uh, April 
twenty second for now meet don't get you to the second meeting in May. May nineteenth. May nineteenth council meeting. May nineteenth, okay. Recognize Councilman Brown. Yep. Thank you. I, I think it's important, however, to recognize the fact that we're extending the time on this until April or May in order to obtain more information. That's correct, Steve. Yes, sir. But that information will be supplied by your department as well as the applicant. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. We have another question. Uh, can we? I'd like to entertain a motion on the public hearing is open. Uh, I've heard you want to extend it to Third, first cycle in May. Well, give me a date. May nineteenth. Okay. Do I have a motion to that effect? I so move. Is there a second? Second. It's been a proper move and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Any other items to come before the council? If not, the council is adjourned at 9.20 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>